Okay, so we're focused here on how terroir or the sense of place can drive the essential character of a wine. And it's a fascinating study. And it can be a little bit confusing too, because uh, there are some label information that can be very regionally specific. So we're going to focus on terroir in action in Burgundy and then Bordeaux. And then we'll have a, a small horizontal tasting of the Rheingal in Germany, which I'm really looking forward to. So um, what do we have in Burgundy? Well, Burgundy is located in the sort of central eastern part of France. And if you were to sort of cut Burgundy in half, north and south, the northern part is the area known as the Côte de Nuit that specializes in the Pinot Noir grape. And in the south, it's known as the Côte de Beaune, and this area specializes in Chardonnay. So basically, Burgundy, even though it often doesn't say it on the label, Chardonnay is mostly the white wine of Burgundy, and Pinot Noir is mostly the red wine of Burgundy. And here we have the classification system. Now, Burgundy, of all the places in the world, is where it's possible to move 10 meters from one vineyard to the next, and the first vineyard, the wine can cost 20 euros, and in the second vineyard, the wine can cost 200 euros, because they have this patchwork of soils, and it's on a slope, and it's quite interesting to see where the different qualities of wine appear on the slope. So when we talk about the classification of Burgundy, we talk about the pyramid of, of wine quality. The lowest quality is where you have regional Bourgogne wines. Now, Bourgogne is the French word for Burgundy, and it's spelled like this. So you might see that on the label, and if it's red, it's Pinot Noir, and if it's white, it's Chardonnay. And what that means is that the grapes can be sourced anywhere within the Burgundy region. And this makes up more than 50% of the wines produced in Burgundy. And these are uh, inexpensive wines, but they do show some regional character, absolutely, because we have the influence of the soil, the climate, and human management to give a regional character to the wines. We get more specific when we focus on the village. So for example, in the Côte de Nuit, you have villages such as gevrey chambertin and Nuit Saint-Georges. In the Côte de Beaune, we have villages such as pouligny maurichet and uh, chambord moussini And each village has its own character, even if it's made by the same winemaker in the same year using the same production methods. And that's why we're really focusing on terroir in this video. You can get even more specific. Vineyards within a village can be classified as Premier Cru or Grand Cru. Uh, Premier Cru means that they are consistently at a very high level. And Grand Cru, the top 2% of vineyards, are consistently the best year in, year out. And so we have examples of Grand Cru vineyards such as Saint-Georges in Nuit Saint-Georges and Chambertin in the village of gevray Chambertin. So you might notice that the top vineyard is often included in the name of the village in Burgundy. Pouligny Montrachet. Montrachet is the most famous vineyard of the Pouligny village. And so they've incorporated that into the name. So where do they appear on this slope? When I went to Burgundy the first time, for some reason, and I don't know why, but for some reason I thought the Grand Cru vineyards would be at the top because, you know, these are the, the most difficult vineyards to manage because you're kind of on a steep slope. And I naturally thought these must be the Grand Cru vineyards, but they're not, surprisingly. The village wines are at the bottom and then Grand Cru and then Premier Cru. Why is that? Well, you can imagine that soil fertility increases as you go down the slope. Soil erosion means that soil moves down the slope and so the richest topsoil is often at the bottom. But surprisingly, vines often don't like a very fertile soil. What tends to happen is the vines produce lots of shoots and lots of leaves without the focus on the production of bunches of grapes. So you kind of want an area 
that is hopefully above the frost line where uh, frost can easily damage the grapes. Where you still have relatively poor soil fertility, but in fact you're protected from some of the uh, more exposed vineyards higher up the slope from wind damage, especially during certain sensitive periods of the growing season. So Grand Cru vineyards often fit comfortably in the middle. So this is the Burgundy system. Grand Cru stands at the top, Premier Cru is next in line. Then you have the village wines and the regional wines. What does this mean for you personally? Well, you can explore terroir on different levels. Imagine picking one producer and drinking three different villages of his wine made from Chardonnay or Pinot Noir grapes. It can make for a fascinating comparison. Or you might compare regional versus village versus Premier Cru versus Grand Cru in a horizontal tasting from the same producer and the same vintage. Again, a great way to show the gradations of quality. Great way to entertain your friends as well at a dinner party. So now let's move to Bordeaux, which is west of Burgundy on the Atlantic coast, to see a different type of terroir in action. So, excuse my drawing, it's not the best, but for these purposes I hope it's, it's good enough. So if you can imagine you have the Atlantic coast here, and then you have the Gironde River here, which splits into the Garonne and to the Dordogne. And we have these two basic regions in Bordeaux called the left bank and the right bank. And in the middle we have an area called entre deux mers, it means between two rivers, and this area tends to be where a lot of the white wines of Bordeaux are made. So for the purposes of our discussion, we're going to simplify Bordeaux into just these two uh, general areas or sub-regions of Bordeaux. Now on the left bank, you have the famous sub-region known as Medoc. And on the right bank, you have one of the regions called saint Emilion. Now, when you're choosing a bottle of Bordeaux, you're choosing a wine that is a blend, generally. And the typical grapes are Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, and Cabernet Franc. Almost every Bordeaux red wine will have some proportion of each of these three varieties in it. And you can you can pick with confidence if you understand some of the basic concepts uh, of the terroir that is happening in Bordeaux. Because we're really talking about the connection between soil types and varieties. So let's start with the left bank. In the left bank you have gravel soil. Now with gravel soil you get excellent water drainage. And when you have excellent water drainage, if it rains, the water passes through the soil very quickly. Now this is perfect for a late ripening variety like Cabernet Sauvignon. See, the problem is that if you have soils that hold a lot of water, that actually delays the ripening. And so for a late ripening variety, it could extend the growing season so much that the grapes don't even ripen at all. So that's why Cabernet Sauvignon is grown on the well-drained gravel soils. And the gravel soils tend to be in the left bank. And Cabernet tends to be a kind of richer, more powerful wine. So that's what you can expect when you drink wines from Medoc. A richer, more powerful, more tannic red wine based on around about 70% Cabernet on average. Now if we go to the right bank in saint Emilion, for example, here we have a mixture of uh, clay soils and some gravel soils too. Now with clay, as compared to gravel, clay tends to retain the moisture in the soil. And that's okay as long as the varieties are mid-season varieties. Now if you have a late ripening variety like Cabernet Sauvignon, a wet clay soil could delay the ripening so much that you would never ripen Cabernet Sauvignon. And so you don't want that. You want to be able to ripen the mid-season varieties, such as 
Merlot and Cabernet Franc. So that's why on the right bank, you have about 40% Merlot, 40% Cabernet Franc, and 20% Cabernet Sauvignon. So my advice if you're buying Bordeaux is if you like a softer, more approachable, and perhaps slightly more fruit-driven style of Bordeaux, then go for Saint-Emilion as one of the possible sub-regions. There are many in Bordeaux, but we're only focused on two. And if you like the stronger, gutsy, uh, intense, tannic reds based on Cabernet Sauvignon, then choose the more uh, strongly built Medoc wines on the left bank. Okay, so that's uh, two different types of terroir. Just a final note on the classification within Bordeaux. You tend to also have a quality pyramid too. And at the very top of the classified wines in Bordeaux, and this is where it gets a bit confusing, here, at least in the French language, Premier Cru is the top wine. Now in Burgundy, we said that Grand Cru is the top wine and Premier Cru is the second to top wine. So that can be a little bit confusing and it's why we often anglicize this to the phrase first growth. second growth, third growth, fourth growth, and fifth growth. Now, one of the big differences between the classification of Burgundy is that Burgundy is based on the vineyard itself. Whereas in Bordeaux, especially the left bank in the Medoc region, it's based on a classification done in 1855, based on a combination of quality and price and prestige. And believe it or not, since that time, only one change has been made in more than 150 years. Quite extraordinary. Still today, you find different levels of quality and price depending on the chateau, not the vineyard, the chateau. And that's an important point to distinguish between the wines of Burgundy and the wines of Bordeaux. So we have first growth, second growth, all the way to fifth growth. And in the PDF that comes with this video, we'll talk about some of the other wines that you can buy from Bordeaux. This is the very top, the very pinnacle of quality, but Bordeaux is a large region and there are lots of other great choices out there for affordable Bordeaux drinking. Now, we talked about two red wines, and now let's do a tasting of two white wines from Riesling, my favorite variety. And of course, you can always compare Riesling from different regions of different countries. So for example, a great way to learn about the different styles of Riesling is to take a Riesling from Alsace in France and one from the Mosel in Germany and maybe one from the Clare Valley in Australia and taste them side by side. That's a great way to learn about the spectrum of Riesling styles. If you want the gold standard in demonstrating terroir, then it's where you pick the same producer from the same vintage, from the same variety, and two different vineyards. So you're not talking here about winemaking differences. You're talking about the differences of the site itself that comes through into the wine. And it's amazing to think that vineyards can be next to each other and yet produce vastly different qualities. And it's part of the fascination of wine. So let's jump into a tasting, shall we? We have here a 2016 Weingut Karl Erhard Rudesheim Berg Rotland. So this label was a bit confusing. Weingut is the wine cellar. Karl Erhard is the producer. Rudesheim is the village. And Berg Rotland or uh, Hill Rotland is the vineyard and it's from the Rheingau which is one of the regions in Germany and it's trocken, it's a dry wine so all of the sugar has been converted into alcohol. Now same producer with all of the same details except that the vineyard this time is Berg Rosneck and so let's try them side by side and see if we can taste terroir in action. So the first wine, Berg Rotland. 
I'm getting pronounced pineapple and stone fruits. Beautiful, intense citrus fruits, especially lemon and lime. Mouth-watering acidity. And what a lot of wine tasters describe as minerality. Some people call it wet stone. It's a, a kind of vague description which a lot of people associate with the soil. The truth is we don't know where minerality comes from, except that some vineyards seem to express it more than others. Uh, the second one, bag. A rose neck. So everything the same except the vineyard. Now I should say that both of these wines or these vineyards are from the steep slate soils of the Rheingau in Germany. Now slate is a wonderful material because the the heat of the day is absorbed and it's released at night and so you get this wonderful effect of, of extra ripening potential based on the stored heat in the slate soils. Very, very uh, particular to certain parts of Germany, especially Rheingau and the Mosel. The second wine is not as intense, but still kind of lemony and citrusy. Overall, I'm getting a softer impression. I, I like both styles. I, I have to say I prefer the second wine because of the concentration of flavor. The second wine is lighter, softer, with slightly less intensity and concentration of flavor, but still very similar to the first wine, just softer and lighter. Amazing to think that there is not much distance between these two vineyards and everything else is the same. So that is terroir in action. The gold standard, if you want to really examine differences between vineyards, try and keep all of the factors the same and just tweak the different vineyards and you'll get a fascinating tasting.